Well, here we go. Wednesday evening, the Lord's been watering the earth. We appreciate when the Lord waters the earth. Sometimes we appreciate it more than other times. If it's picnic time, we don't want the Lord to water the earth. It's picnic time. <clears throat> the farmers have been praying for rain. They pray for rain all the time. People who aren't farmers, not so much. <laughs> to be honest with you, I don't pray for rain a whole lot, even though I know we need it. <laughs> hey, I wanted to remind everyone that starting next week, next Wednesday, <clears throat> we're going to be doing a, a short series on the... Uh, Jesus Style by Gail Irwin. And uh, we have uh, made available to those of you who want to participate in this study um, a copy of his book, Jesus Style. And uh, what we want to do, just because of limited resources, we don't want to, um, we want to limit the books that we give out to one book per family. And uh, so you guys who are planning on being here on Wednesdays, can feel free to grab a copy of that. Um, we do, obviously, it's, it's one of those things where we would prefer that those who are planning on being here on Wednesday nights grab a copy. If you're not planning on being here, then maybe talk to Byron about it, getting a copy of it if you just want it for your, because you want to follow along at home or something like that. Might be able to work something like that out, but we want to make sure we have enough for everybody who's going to be attending, okay? Um, those are available in the back. Are they inside or are they out in the foyer? They're out in the foyer. So if you want to go ahead and grab your copy now, you can start reading it, I suppose, and, and uh, get a head start on things. But that's next Wednesday. We're going to start that series on, the, uh, on Jesus style, how to walk like Jesus walked. We're always trying to achieve that, aren't we? Trying to grow an understanding and the knowledge of the Lord so that we can Live as Jesus lived. All right. Well, for tonight, um, what I want to do tonight is uh, what I want to share this evening is actually based on several things that have stirred my heart in recent weeks. Uh, first of all, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago about a teaching that I heard it was a bad teaching, it wasn't a good teaching, and it was from a prominent evangelical pastor that in an underhanded way, he uh, undermined basically the authority of the Bible. I was very grieved when I heard the teaching. Um, but then, the flip side of that, just a few days ago, I heard a very, actually it was yesterday, I heard a very positive testimony about an ancient Hebrew manuscript on, of Leviticus that was discovered and it was recently deciphered. And it turns out that it was uh, the copy of this Hebrew manuscript was nearly, after it was translated, it was nearly identical to the form of the book that we have in our English Bibles today, the book of Leviticus. <clears throat> and the manuscript was very, very old. I don't remember the date of it, but it was uh, hundreds and hundreds of years old. So that was a very encouraging thing to see just one more way that God was validating, is validating his word. And so a combination of factors got me to thinking about the authority of God's word, the authority of the Bible in our lives, and how much we value the word of God in our lives. Now, the basic premise of that bad sermon that I mentioned earlier <clears throat> was actually an attempt to pinpoint the reason why so many people are leaving the church today, experiencing what this particular minister called a D conversion. And it was his view that this exodus was happening because people were basing their faith on the wrong foundation. 
This pastor insisted that the basic premise behind the old adage based on the song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, that that idea was insufficient to keep people glued to the faith. That Christians essentially needed to stop basing their faith solely on the Bible and instead base it on the historical event of Jesus' resurrection. Now, at first glance, that may not seem to be problematic. But Lord willing, it's, going to, it's, it's my intention to do a full teaching against this sermon, demonstrating how utterly misdirected that particular premise is for reasons that I hope to explain, explain later. I'm not going in that direction tonight. Um, quite frankly, I have to find a, uh, <clears throat> a transcript of the sermon. I don't feel like typing the whole sermon out so that when I present point, counterpoint kind of a thing, I want to make sure that I have it up there on the screen so we all can read along together. But the, just the basic idea of what he was sharing just really stirred my soul. And so tonight's focus is going to be based on having a healthy view of biblical inspiration. And I believe that it's very clear in the scriptures, uh, it's very clear what it takes to persevere. Now, believing in the resurrection is certainly foundational to our belief as Christians. But the Bible is how we know that. And, every, and, and along with everything else pertaining to the Christian faith, we understand that because of what it says in the Bible. So tonight's devotional musing is going to be on the subject of the perseverance of the saints. That's right, the perseverance of the saints. So we're going to begin tonight in the Gospel of Matthew, go figure. <clears throat> and we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 24. Now I'm wondering how many of you, as soon as you heard me say, perseverance of the saints, started to think immediately about Calvinism, And, of course, there's the, the, the acronym that's used for the five points of Calvinism, the acronym TULIP, T-U-L-I-P. And the P stands for perseverance, the perseverance of the saints. We're not going to be focusing on the P in TULIP tonight, okay? But we are going to be examining a few aspects of the biblical concept of persevering. And as our launching point, we're going to begin with this uh, eschatological slash apocalyptical portion of Matthew's gospel where Jesus gives us a very vivid description of end times distress followed by a description of his glorious return. Now for our purposes, we are only going to be focusing on a couple of verses from the first section of this chapter. Before we pray, I know this has been a long introduction. Uh, the message is going to be even longer. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> much longer. Uh, before we actually pray, I want to go ahead and read through Matthew chapter 24. Let's go ahead and read through the first 13 verses. And then we'll pray. Verse 1, beginning to read. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you, 
For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. And you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. And at that time many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. <clears throat> many false prophets will arise and will lead and will mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. The love of many, I like the King James, will wax cold. <clears throat> but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, once again, we thank you for this wonderful assembly Lord, being able to assemble together tonight in the comfort of this building <clears throat> and the warmth of this building and the shelter that this building provides for us, Lord, free from distraction, Lord, it's quiet. We can all hear good and uh, we have open Bibles in our laps. Lord, you've given us everything we need to make sure that there's no distraction in our lives. <laughs> But we do have to cast down every thought, every imagination and high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of you and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We have to keep our hearts in check. <clears throat> we have to keep our minds from wandering, our eyes from roaming. So Lord, help us to do that right now. And help us to hear with open hearts how you want to speak to us tonight. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight's teaching is going to actually be a very, very simple, it's not really going to be that profound, to be honest with you. But <clears throat> I guess uh, profundity is, is, can be based upon how a person receives something, huh? Sometimes we think things are, are very profound that aren't. We might think they're profound because they sound very wordy, very complicated. Sometimes the simplest things are the most profound. Like when Paul said, I have endeavored to do nothing among you except preach Christ and him crucified. How boring is that? Not boring at all. We consider the depth of what it means that we were saved by Jesus Christ dying on the cross. Well, here we have an end time scenario. <clears throat> the chapter begins with an inquiry, inquiry, that's a hard for, word for me to say, an inquiry from the disciples asking Jesus about his second coming and the end of the world. Jesus began the discourse in verse 4 with a warning about being deceived. Jesus answered and said to them, Look at verse 4 again. See to it that no one misleads you. Jesus said false Christ would appear. National turmoil would come. Civil unrest, natural disasters, severe persecution would be rampant. rampant. There would be betrayal by family and friends. People would fall away from the faith. And there would be religious deception from false prophets. You know, it is interesting that there are a lot of people, even non-believers, that are very intrigued with prophecy. They're very intrigued with wanting to know what's going to happen. When's it, when's it going to happen? What are the signs of it happening? Prophecy gets a lot of people's attention. <clears throat> Jesus, of course, wasn't concerned about tickling people's ears with providing information about the end times. What should alarm the Christian is what he says in verses 12 and 13. 
Look at verse 12 again. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. Because of the massive amount of wicked influence, love would grow, or King James, wax cold. One commentator said <clears throat> that phrase, waxing cold, could be defined as spiritual energy blighted or chilled by a malign or poisonous wind. I like that. That's profound. <clears throat> okay? But then Jesus adds in verse 13, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. With as many people as are fascinated about prophecy, it's fine for the Christian to be fascinated, is probably not the word I would use. It's fine for a Christian to appreciate prophecy and want to learn about prophecy because prophecy obviously is very important. End times prophecy is very important. But for the Christian, for anybody, the real concern should be, how does that affect you? Where are you gonna be? What spiritual state are you gonna be in when this happens? Jesus said the one who endures to the end will be saved. That's actually our reference point right there. Jesus said the one who perseveres. The word endure there means, textbook definition, from a lexicon, it means to maintain a belief or course of action in the face of opposition. It means to stand one's ground. It means to hold out. Here what Jesus is saying in verse 13 is he's stating a condition of existence during this troubled period. Lawlessness would increase the love of many people would wax cold. Spiritual energy, if you will, would be blighted. But the one who perseveres is the one who would be saved. Now, interest interestingly, the Apostle Paul, describing the very same time period that Jesus is talking about here, offers a very similar warning in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's turn there. 2 Timothy 3. <clears throat> and this is where we're going to be spending the rest of our time. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we're going to read through, we're going to start from verse 1. I don't think I'm going to use this bottle anymore up here. <laughs> Verse 1. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Last days, the apocalypse, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So there we see <clears throat> this bounding of iniquity. Okay? Because an iniquity will increase, will abound, the love of many will wax cold. This will be the state of human existence. Look at verse 5, though. Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. That's a real dangerous state of mind to be in. That's a dangerous state of heart to have having a form of godliness but denying its power. In other words, you could probably live like the people that are stated in verses 2 and 
two through four, and yet still have a, a profession of godliness. Then he adds, avoid such men as these, for, verse five, or verse six, connecting word there, for among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses. So there you have your false prophets, Matthew chapter 24. There you have these, what we would call religious imposters. And these individuals are those who enter into households. Now, <clears throat> back then, 2,000 years ago, they would have literally entered into households. Today, they don't need to literally enter in. They can be brought in through television, through the internet. We can invite them into our homes and the privacy of our homes right through the television set. And that's where we see many of them. Many of them are broadcast over the airwaves and there women, weak women, weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, just soak it in, send them their money as they're taught lies from these false prophets. Verse seven continues, <clears throat> always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's sad, isn't it? Always learning, but yet they never arrive. Now, <clears throat> that is one of the state, that, that's one of the most dangerous state that a human being can be in, is when they're constantly learning, but yet they never come to the proper knowledge of the truth they're learning about. Imagine that. <clears throat> Imagine someone who sits and hears a lot of Bible teaching. They hear the truth, and yet they never, <clears throat> excuse me, their hearts never latch onto it. They never make a connection. It never does anything on the inside. It doesn't change who they are and how they act. But then he adds verse eight, look at that. <clears throat> Just as Jannies and Jambres opposed Moses so these men also oppose the truth. Men of depraved mind rejected in regard to the faith. The reprobates. King James says the reprobates. These are the kind of men who have a lot of knowledge. I mean, you can get, <clears throat> excuse me, you can have a guy like Benny Hinn or any one of those faith movement types, Ken Copeland. And, and they have a lot of Bible knowledge. How is it that those men are so depraved? How is it that those men are so deceived and yet have so much Bible knowledge? They share that Bible knowledge. And they use that Bible knowledge to enslave people to their false doctrine. It's an amazing thing. They'll even quote the same scriptures I'm reading tonight. <clears throat> Yet they themselves, the teachers themselves, are not able to come to a realization of the truth. But just as Jannies and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Remember Jannies and Jambres? Maybe you don't know this, but they're actually the two magicians who opposed Moses. They're not named in Exodus. We're given the names here in 2 Timothy. These men were able to work miracles by the power of darkness, not by the power of God. The ability to do miracles by the power of darkness and the willingness <clears throat> to receive them as authentic is something that's gonna characterize the end times. Remember, the Antichrist is gonna be able to wow everybody with what he's able to do. But even if a psychic or a new age, <clears throat> some sort of new age power seems to look right. Jesus warned that we're not to be seduced by that because demonic powers can come masquerading as angels of light. The resistance of truth by Jannies and Jambres 
was shown by their ability to cooperate with demon powers and to do miracles. In these last days that Paul's speaking of here, men will be able to do this as well, but they will actually be resistant to truth. But notice verse 9. Look at verse 9. <clears throat> but they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Jannies and Jambres' folly was also. So just as Jannies and Jambres were eventually put to shame. Remember, eventually they got to the point where they couldn't perform the miracle anymore. Suddenly, even they realized, oh, hold on a second, we're messing with something here that's way beyond the powers that drive us. And they were eventually compelled, somewhat reluctantly, to, gl to give glory to God. And so will, these, so will the evil men of the last days. Jannies and Jambres had to come to grips with the fact that their power had limits. Satan's power always has limits. God is always the one ultimately that's in control, even though at times he may give Satan a very long leash. <clears throat> Let him do a lot. So Paul gives this information about the end times, very similar to what Jesus does, even though Jesus goes into it in much more detail. But from this point on, Paul proceeds to offer some very practical instruction as to how Timothy and us can persevere when there is an onslaught of this kind of spiritual oppression. Look at verse 10, <clears throat> continuing on. He says, Now you, Timothy, okay, that's what's going to happen. And these are the types of people that are, are going to come out into the forefront. And they're going to be doing their thing. And the people are going to be following. And people are going to be doing their thing. And love is going to grow cold because of the abounding iniquity. But you, Timothy, you follow my teaching. Excuse me. You followed my teaching. Conduct, purpose, faith, patience, Love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them, <clears throat> the Lord rescued me. He's saying here basically to Timothy, Timothy, you've seen the example of my own godly life. You've also seen the consequences of following Christ. Paul was very open about the fact that Paul didn't conceal the cost that was involved in being a follower of Jesus Christ. But Paul said to Timothy, you've seen my manner of life, you've watched me. You understood that there was great persecutions that I endured. See, in other words, my love didn't wax cold. You watched me as I experienced everything that hell could throw at me. And you have seen a pattern in me to know that, Timothy, look, this is the way, this is the path that you should walk on. Verse 12, continuing, <clears throat> Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But, verse 13, But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. In spite of the consequences of their sin, these men will continue to follow what, what comes natural for them. They're just going to follow their sinful natures right into destruction, right off the edge of the cliff. You've seen me, but understand, Timothy, that there's going to be people that are not like us. They're not following in this path. They're following a destructive path. Now you could go that direction. You could walk with them right off the edge of the cliff like the lemmings do. The little lemmings, you know. One lemming goes and all the other lemmings just follow and they'll walk right off the edge of a cliff. You could do that. You could be that way. Paul continues, 
You, however, verse 14, <clears throat> continue in the things that you have learned and have become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. Timothy, you've learned a lot of things. And right now, you, you firmly believe them. You have learned many things, but Timothy, now you have to continue to abide by those things that you have learned. You have to persevere. You have to continue in these things. You must never let them go. The word you there in verse 14, what it begins verse 14, is an emphatic contrast to what Paul said in verse 13. Timothy was to strongly set himself against the course that some other men were taking. Timothy had been told earlier on that there were going to be approved and disapproved workers. Timothy, you have to continue the things that you, that you have learned. Timothy is being told that there's going to be dangerous times and dangerous men in the last days. But you, Timothy, have to continue in the things that you have learned. Timothy is being told that there's going to be hardship, there's going to be persecution. As you follow God, there's no doubt that all of hell is going to be thrown at you to try to bump you off that path as you follow God. But Timothy, you must continue in the things which you have learned. He continues on, verse 15. And that from childhood, you have known the sacred writings, the holy scriptures, which were able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. From childhood means that it came to him. First and first of all, we, we understand this from what he says elsewhere. It came to him through the influence of his grandmother and his mother, Lois and Eunice, respectively. From his young childhood, they taught him. They taught him the sacred writings, the holy scriptures. The use here of Holy Scriptures is referring to the Old Testament because this is what Timothy would have learned from his grandmother Eunice and his mother Lois. From childhood, you have been made to know the Holy Scriptures. Timothy had known the Word of God from his earliest years. Yet we see how strong the exhortation here is from Paul that he continue in them. Nothing is assumed. The furthest thing from Paul's mind is an attitude that says, well, of course, <clears throat> we, we are all founded on the Bible and we can assume that and just move on to other things. Yeah, we understand, you know, that the, the scriptures are all, the, they're great and all that. No, Paul is drilling this into Timothy you need to understand how you came to understand what you now believe. For Paul, this was never assumed, not even with his trusted protege, Timothy. You came into contact with all of this before you ever knew me, Paul was saying. You came into contact with this heritage through God's word. The very word of God that was able as it says there, to make, to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying here, continue in the things that you have learned because of their great value. There's no greater wisdom than this, than what God says in his word, than anything else in the world. There's no greater wisdom to be found in the world than what is found in what you, Timothy, have been anchored in. 
And this is something that each generation has to acquire for itself and then hold on to it. An appreciation for the wisdom that comes from God's word. And a deliberate forsaking of any human wisdom that opposes or replaces what the Bible teaches. Of course, we understand, and we don't think for a moment, that mere Bible knowledge saves. There are those who know the words of the Bible very well, and yet they are not wise for salvation. But... For some of you young people here tonight, there's a great legacy that you are, you are coming in on. And you've been, you've been brought into that legacy because your parents were saved and they impressed upon you the need to be saved. And now many of you young people tonight here are professing Christians. You say that you're saved. But... Are you holding on to your salvation in the same way that your parents are? Are you laying a hold of that in the same way that they have laid a hold of it? Or are you riding on their coattails? Do you have your own relationship with Jesus tonight? If you do have a relationship with Jesus tonight, the reason you have it is because you were taught it. Somebody taught it to you. You came to that information somehow. Unless you could enlighten me and say, oh no, actually I wasn't taught it by any human. An angel appeared to me, but even if that's the case, you were still taught it. Any way you slice it, the information made it to your ears, to your mind, and to your heart. And then verse 16. <clears throat> All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now this is interesting because after what he said in verse, first, verse 15, Paul then says in verse 15, 16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching. The implication here, the obvious implication here, is that the phrase all scripture indicates more than the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament. If Paul meant the exact same thing here in verse 16 as what Timothy learned as a child, that he might have said something like those scriptures, referring back to verse 15, or he might have just repeated the exact same phrase, uh, sacred writings or holy scriptures. Paul here changed his wording because he recognized that what God uniquely brought forth from the apostles and prophets in this time was also scripture. This was also the God-breathed word of of God. This included what he and others knew was emerging as the written form of the foundation of the apostles and prophets mentioned in Ephesians 2.20. There's no doubt Paul thought this way, knowing that God was bringing forth a New Testament through the apostles of the first century. No doubt about it at all. Paul commanded the public congregational reading of his letters he commanded that this would be done with the Hebrew scriptures. Paul called his own message in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, the word of God. In 1 Timothy 5.18, Paul combined a quotation from the Old Testament and some words of Jesus in Luke 10.17, and he called both of them scripture. And Paul wasn't the only one that thought this way. 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16 indicates the same idea, especially when Peter included Paul's writings under the heading of scriptures. All of this reminds us that even in apostolic times, they were all well aware that God was bringing forth more holy scripture 
Just as Jesus promised, just as Paul described, and just as Peter understood. And here in verse 16, he says all of this was given by inspiration of God or, and this is where the NIV gets it right, God breathed is actually the best way to translate that. And so Paul here exhorts Timothy, continue in these things because the Bible comes from God and not man. It's a God-inspired book breathed out from God himself. Very powerful. This means that God himself inspired the very words that they wrote. And he says in verse 17, uh, excuse me, look at verse 16 again. He says this God-breathed scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. It's through this God-breathed scripture scripture that we grow and that we are able to maintain our spiritual endurance so that we can persevere. It keeps the fear of God before our eyes. It builds us up in every spiritually conceivable way. And that's why he ends this by saying, so that, verse 17 again, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. This is how we're equipped. This is how we're made strong. Now the Hebrew writer said something very cool about the Bible. He said, for the word of God is living and active and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. It's a very interesting, those are very interesting words about the nature of God's word. How it's active, living and active. It's a living word. And it's yet sharper than a two-edged sword. It's able to go into the heart, into the mind. It's able to go in and illuminate. And it's able to show to the person who's reading it what they're really like. Isn't that amazing? Better than any psychologist is an open Bible. And it's able to pinpoint because it's able to get down into this spiritual part of our being, the immaterial part of our being the part that no one else can see and the part that no one else knows better than God. That's a, that's a pretty powerful thing to say about the, the Holy Scriptures. And this God-breathed Scripture makes it so the man of God can be adequate and can be equipped for every good work. Consider what the Apostle Peter said. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, it's verse 23. It says about us that we have been, if we're Christian, that we have been born again, not of a seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. Now listen to this. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory is, like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off. In other words, you think about <clears throat> everything that's in, in existence on planet Earth, all of it has an end. Even we have an end to our earthly existence. Cars die and turn into rust piles. Grass burns, withers, dies. Flowers die, trees die. But the word of God, the nature of the word of God is entirely different. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. So the eternal word, and that's what it's referring to, the eternal word 
It's the word that goes out and we hear it. And we have an opportunity to respond to that word. So persevering to the end means that we are holding fast to our head, who is Jesus, right? But our understanding of Jesus comes from the Bible. Our understanding of Jesus is increased, it's enhanced, it's made strong as we feast on the scriptures. Now, here's a question that we can all ask ourselves. What does it mean when we say that we are under the authority of God's word? If I were to ask anybody here tonight, are you under the authority of God's word? Now, of course, all of us would have to say perfectly no, right? We'd all have to admit that. But when we speak of being under the authority of God's word, we don't necessarily mean that. We mean that is it really the governing authority of our lives? So in other words, if there's attitudes of the heart, does, does the word of God, do we allow the word of God to, to, to come in and speak to us about those attitudes? Or about feelings that we have, or emotions that we have? I'm feeling very angry today. If we're under the authority of God's word, what do we do with that? How do we deal with that anger? How do we deal with that emotion? How do we deal with that attitude? Do, do, do we bring the word of God to bear upon that? Do we look for an answer in the word of God? Why am I so mad all the time? Does the Bible say something about this? Why am I struggling so bad with lust? Do we bring the Bible to that problem and say, you know, what does God have to say about this? I, I, need to do some, I need to do some research on this. I need to get a concordance. I need to ask somebody, hey, I'm struggling with this. Does God's word say anything about this? Can I find a, an answer to this, a, a solution to this in the Bible? See, if we're not doing that, we, then we can't honestly say that I'm, that I'm under the authority of God's word. Because if I'm under the authority of God's word, it means <clears throat> that Jesus, he, that he's my Lord, but he's my Lord because, well, I'm going to the Bible to learn about how I'm supposed to engage in everyday life. Here's a good one. Uh, man, should I... Should I eat that last thing there? I'm already stuffed. You know, gluttony's a sin. Gluttony's a sin. You know that it's wrong to eat to the point where you feel sick? That's a sin. It's just as much of a sin as being drunk. Normally, drunkenness and gluttony are coupled together in the Bible when they're mentioned. Or promiscuity. Some people have no conviction about being promiscuous. They'll flirt with people of the opposite sex that they're not married to with no conscience of it at all. But see, as Christians, we're to bring ourselves under the authority of the Word of God. And the Word of God is God's Word. Now, there are all kinds of attacks on the Word of God. And one of the things that I'm hoping to do when, I, when we take the time to go through that sermon that I mentioned earlier is I, I want to talk about some of the things that people are saying about the Bible today to sort of undermine its authority. Because it's one thing to say that the Bible contains the truth. There's a lot of true things in that book, but it's a whole different thing to say, no, the Bible is the truth. That's a completely different thing. And so if I'm kind of fuzzy on that, if I'm not 100% sure, I mean, yeah... The preacher man's always telling me the Bible's the word of God. But there's a whole segment of our society that calls that into question. And I can tell you if, anybody, and if you, if any of you are struggling with that tonight, we need to sit down and talk. Because you, you need to get a handle on that. You need to know when 1 Peter says, you've, 
been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. The word of the Lord endures forever, and this is the word which was preached to you. We're all gonna be held accountable to what's in this Genesis to Revelation. That's what we're gonna be held accountable to. So, perseverance of the saints. Well, the saints are persevering because they're holding on to Christ, and if they're holding on to Christ, they're holding on to his word. They're believing his word. They're trusting its authority, its reliability. Satan is going all out in unprecedented ways to discredit the validity of the Bible. Unfortunately, some evangelical ministers are playing right into his hands. They're, they're sharing from the pulpit things that would actually cause people to think less about the authority of the word of God in their lives. <laughs> I have a real problem with that because God has a real problem with that. So think about what Paul is exhorting Timothy here. I want you, let's pretend we're all Timothy tonight, okay? And, that, and Paul is telling this to all of us. Remember those things you've learned. Maybe I wasn't. From a child, I did not know the Holy Scriptures, okay? I didn't get saved till I was 26. But that was 28 years ago. And so I've come a long way since then, and I know a lot now, a lot more than I used to. And so I want to take these words of Paul and I, I want to embrace this. And I, I want to, as, as simplistic as that is, and we say, well, that's just baby steps there. That's what people should hear when they're first saved. No, that's what Christians have to constantly be exposed to. Even the apostle Peter said, I'm going to stir up your minds by remi reminding you of something that you, you already know. You've already been established in. Because sometimes we lose sight of the simplest things and we end up kind of majoring on the minors when we need to major, when we actually need to major on the minors. We need to focus on some of those, those foundational things. So brothers and sisters, the perseverance of the saints, if Jesus says the love of many is going to wax cold, you know, I, I, I don't want my love to wax cold. I want my love to stay strong. He that will endure to the end shall be saved. There's also a promise in that, right? A good promise. That's a positive thing. Holding on. Some of us may feel like I'm barely holding on. Hold on in any way you can. And hold fast to the word of God that's been delivered to us and embrace it with all your hearts. And know this, young people. Know this. Be students of the scriptures. Be Bible lovers. Love God's word. Love your Bibles. Seek to know your Bibles. Don't let it be a stranger. And to some of us older folks as well. Don't, let it, don't be a stranger to the word of God. Know it inside and out. At least endeavor to. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, we give you praise tonight because of your faithfulness, Lord, to continuously remind us of the things that need to remain the main thing. We want to give you praise tonight, God, for bringing your salvation to our hearts for knowing that your word will endure forever. For knowing, Lord, that if, that if I've trusted on what I've read in the scriptures and I stand before you on that last day, if I'm holding fast to those words, I will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Lord, I pray that you would help us to persevere. 
I pray, Lord God, that you would help us to be steadfast in our faith. I know that we've heard a lot about this recently, especially on Wednesday nights. But Lord, as I read through the Gospel of Matthew, Lord Jesus, you are constantly stirring the pot. So thank you for stirring our souls. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a proper understanding of your word and for helping us to see <clears throat> the, the source of your word as being God-breathed. And we dare not tamper with it. But we do want to embrace it. And we do want to love it. Because it's your word straight to us. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. He won't abandon. He won't deceive. He won't desert us. He won't ever leave. He'll never forsake us. He won't ever run. He'll never reject us. The